Hey, thank you very much to Qued for uh, inviting us to come and talk. Uh, we're very grateful for the opportunity. Um, I had a few slides, actually, to base the talk on that I was going to give. And just see if technology works. Yes, it does. Can't really see my own slides. Um, but oh, I will make do with what I can see. Uh, before I start talking about what cooperative banks thinks about the green paper, I do have to say a few words about cooperative banks. Now, you will probably think banks are banks. I mean, what can we learn about banks? Well, there's big banks, there's small banks. You already knew that. But there's also such a thing as cooperative banks. And what is special about cooperative banks, and we cannot fail to educate on this point enough, and that is that cooperative banks have a legal structure which is different from joint stock companies. And that translates into the fact that we have clients that can become member. It's the members who make up the capital of cooperative banks. And the way uh, the capital structure of cooperative banks works is that it's based on contributions by members and retained earnings. So not shares, not stock exchange. This translates also in the way we function. We have maximization of profits not as an objective per se. We want profits because we want to continue to deliver services to our members, which are also our clients. So it's yes, profit, but not per se. It also translates into the way we're organized. We have, as I said, clients that can become members. And what that means is that you'll find a lot of smaller cooperative banks active in regions, uh, uh, regions of Europe where other banks have disappeared. And those smaller cooperative banks, in order to compete with larger banking groups, have regrouped themselves in central entities of which they hold the shares. And those central entities perform key functions such as payment processing, securities processing, data protection, control, compliance control, and also, at this present moment, looking into the opportunities of digitalization and how it can make the interaction with the clients better. So this before I go into the green paper. Then, cooperative banks vis-a-vis -vis cross-border financial services, because this is what the green paper is all about. So I want to bring you back to basics. For banks, cooperative banks, what are the drivers for cross-border activity? I think it's important to understand this when we talk about retail financial services. First thing is that if you consider cross-border activity as a cooperative bank, you do so because you want to accompany your client. You have an existing client, whether it is an individual or an SME or a corporate, they want to go cross-border. They want to buy a house cross-border, they want to export, they want to implant themselves in another country. So, as a good bank, you want to accompany your customer. This is a good driver for going cross-border. Second driver of cross-border is accommodating new customers. You have groups of customers coming in from other member states, for example, you're in France and you find a lot of UK nationals wanting to buy houses. What do you do? You try to develop a mortgage solution that can solve the problem of those customers. Or on the whole, if you have some expertise to export or you see that in a new member state there's a market to be deployed, that's when you go cross-border. But all in all, the prerequisites of doing this, and I call them barriers between brackets, is that you need to have an activity that makes economic sense. Okay, cooperative banks are not there for profit maximization, but you do need to make some profit to continue to exist. So economic sense is one big driver, and if you like, a barrier for cross-border activity. Also, you need to be able to deliver a good service to the client. What use is it to be abroad, but not able to understand what your client abroad wants? Because you don't speak the language, because you don't know the local customs, is it a Czech user, not a Czech user? Between France and the Netherlands, there's a big difference. You need to understand the legal framework. What are the tax breaks that the local government is giving on savings products? What are the tax breaks the local government is giving on mortgage products? What's the AML framework? How, um, how, um, say, how serious is the local uh, regulator with your know your customer pr uh, principles? Uh, what's the civil law code in the different countries? Because civil law is what determines what the rights are of your customer in case of problems. So all these things you need to understand if you go abroad. And finally, also not to be underestimated, if you decide to go into a foreign market, for example, mortgages, you do need to know what the property values are. 
what the housing market is doing because you're taking a risk by extending a loan. And you're extending a loan with savings that you received from other customers. So you cannot just extend the loan for the sake of extending the loan. It's a careful deliberation. So when cooperative banks have gone abroad, and they have gone abroad, they have chosen to do so up to now by uh, creating local banks or by partnering up with local banks because they saw that as the best way to secure that they indeed could follow the customer and provide a service that is high quality enough. Okay, that's about the basics. Now, cooperative banks vis-a-vis -vis the green paper. I think I don't have to explain to you, based on my last slide, that there are barriers. There are barriers. I've mentioned them in the last slide to doing cross-border banking and cross-border retail services. Digitalization can help. It can help you in finding information, both for the client and for the bank, providing information, both for the client, both for banks. It can help you, um, um, how do you say, interact with your customer. It can make the sometimes heavy and cumbersome processes that banks impose upon their customers a lot more consumer friendly. Uh, it facilitates customer identification, which is also, it has been brought up by a number of speakers in its important uh, evolution. And it helps other service providers competing with us, I have to be honest, to come up into the market and plug the holes where we have left out. This is the case, and this is what uh, fintechs and technology is bringing. Having said all that, it is not a panacea. It cannot solve all problems, and we do need to be realistic with what it can and cannot do. And I kind of suspect that some of the consumer representatives might say it will also create some other problems because you need another way of customer protection, consumer protection. You need to make sure that in the shortened information that digital channels provide you, you still have enough information so the customer can make his choice. Um, on the whole, though, and I've heard the previous speaker say we should not wait for the uh, body of legislation that we're presently looking at to be implemented. Well, I agree that technology is moving so fast that we cannot stand still, but we do need to have a good look at what is in there and what the present body of legislation is actually already doing. I say that not just because we're all as banks really busy still trying to decipher what the level two arrangements are and then implementing them and translating them into practice. But also, if you look at MIFID, PRIPS, PAD, PSD2, mortgage credit, MIF, SIPA regulation, PSD2, data protection, IDS, IML4, and I'm just mentioning a few, <laughs> they have a few relevant points that are also relevant to this debate. This debate. For example, the SEPA regulation and PAD, they both contribute to increased mobility of the customer. Uh, MIFID, PSD2, MIF are both, or all three of them, focused on increasing transparency. Again, PRIPS and PAD, they're clearly trying to contribute to a better comparability of service. And then again, PAD is clearly trying to drive the possibility for customers to switch between banks. And then standardization, at least in the area of payments, I think the SEPA regulation is getting us quite far. And if it's not the SEPA regulation, then there's the Euro Retail Payments Board, which is driving the banks to standardization in the area of mobile payments and instant payments. So there is quite some stuff already on the way, but not yet in place. So we do need to measure at some point the effects of this regulation before moving too fast, too quickly. So, just to sum up from our side, what do we think is needed? Well, as I said, legislation needs to be allowed to sort effect, and it also needs to be measured, because if we're going to initiate new things, and we don't even know what the last round of regulation has had as an impact, I'm not sure we're going to be very efficient regulators. I think we also need some form of stability, and by that I don't mean standstill, I just mean let's you know, keep pace with ourselves as well and also believe in what has already been done. Digitalization offers opportunities and threats, but maybe we don't have to intervene until it's really necessary. Uh, on this very specific point, we believe that the level two laws of um, the AML directive could help us by making the electronic identification of our customers legally 
of the same value as the identification that we presently have to do with passports in hand and person in front of us. That is still where we are at the moment. And finally, a uh, level playing field for us in whatever we do is important. And this is not just between incumbent providers and new providers, but also between the digital and the non-digital world. And this I'm saying also because um, the non-digital world has its advantages, but it also has its disadvantages in certain customer groups for certain areas, geographical areas, where if we all go digital, banks will have to shut down their branches, and then there is a part of the population which not be served. So there is always pros and cons to be, be looked at in this context. And this is where I want to leave my contribution today.